who is a professor at Caltech and uh, the director of the decision optimization and learning at Caltech Laboratory. He has a pretty broad set of research interests from you know bandits to uh, uh, to robotics, and he has an interesting um, mix of more applied and more theoretical ideas. And in particular, he's going to be talking about I assume online control today. So if everyone could please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Yue. All right. Uh, please Thank take you. away. Thank you. You can hear me. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to try to keep this um, as contained as possible. So today I'll be talking about competitive algorithms for online control. And this talk is really at the intersection of two topics. One is online control, which we've heard a lot about in the previous talk. And the other one is on competitive online optimization. Uh, you, you heard a little bit about online optimization in the previous talk. I'm going to talk about it more from a competitive uh, ratio standpoint. And I should also mention that the bulk of this work was done in collaboration with Adam Weirman's group at Caltech. Adam Weirman's group has been doing quite a bit of research in various forms of competitive online optimization, recently becoming more interested in control. So, you know, we're really leveraging their expertise in developing many of these methods. Okay, so online optimization. So um, let's sort of go through a cartoon what that looks like. So you start with a state x0. You, you observe some function, typically called the hitting cost. And then you want to find, choose an x1, the next state, that minimizes a compromise between minimizing the hitting cost, f1, and the switching cost, which I'll call c. And then at time step two, you receive another hitting cost function, f2. And you've, you've already committed to x1 in the, pre the previous time step. And now the goal is to choose an x2 that minimizes a compromise between minimizing f2 versus the switching cost from switching from x2 to x1. So this is a very standard form of online optimization. And then this process continues until some time horizon has been reached. And so uh, the, the, the line of uh, online comics optimization that sort of started us on this trajectory, this is you know, work by Adam Werman's group, is smooth online comics optimization. And so you have this convex hitting cost, and then you have this movement or switching cost. And at every time step t, you observe, the hitting, you observe the hitting cost function f sub t before you commit to an x sub t. And so the interesting thing here is that you want to design algorithms that minimize the total cost of all the future f sub, f sub t's, the future hitting costs that you might observe in the future, um, et cetera. And so the uh, performance metric is competitive ratio. So this is a little bit different to regret. So for those of you who have, um, are more familiar with regret, competitive ratio is, uh, is more about the, the difference in ratio of the cost achieved by your algorithm that's making decisions on the fly as it's observing each subsequent f sub t and then making a decision versus the offline optimal algorithm. The algorithm that gets to observe a priori the entire sequence of all the hitting costs up front and then computes the optimal solution and minimizes the total cost. And, the, and so that is what the competitive ratio is. Um, and so some comments about competitive ratio. It's a stronger criteria than regret. It's typically much harder to get a good competitive ratio result than, let's say, sublinear regret. Uh, because the offline optimal gets to see the future, the benchmark you're comparing against is a much stronger benchmark. And so the goal then typically uh, is to try to achieve what's called constant competitive ratio, which means that the ratio is constant with respect to the time horizon, hopefully constant uh, you know, with respect to the dimensionality of the problem. So. Uh, the, the, the strongest results are, are, are what's called dimension-free constant competitive ratio, which don't depend on the time horizon of the interaction. Uh, note that if you have constant competitive ratio, this is the final bullet point on the slide, that actually means typically linear regret because you're paying some constant cost every time step. That's what constant competitive ratio means. So you could be achieving linear regret, which is you know, kind of a vacuous statement in, in most regret analysis settings but still be, still be competitive in terms of competitive ratio. And that's because we are indeed comparing against a much stronger benchmark. Now, one of the reasons why uh, my colleague Adam Weirman and his collaborators became interested in uh, smooth online convex optimization is in this application to sustainable data centers, where the basic idea is that, you know, you have a bunch of workloads, you have renewables. Um, so that's the green curve here. That's the solar renewables. And you, know, you want to figure out a way to allocate workloads to take maximal advantage of renewable energy, in this case, let's say, let's say solar. However, you also want to minimize the shifting of the workloads. Because when you spin up and spin down 
uh, servers, that's very expensive. And so the, a complete spin up, spin down cycle is about as expensive in terms of its wear and tear on the server as running, a, running the system uh, sort of continuously for several hours. So, now, so that leads to this, both this hitting cost, which is, large, which is to some extent predictable. You know what the workload is in the next time step and a switching cost, which is the cost associated with spinning up and spinning down servers. And so this was the motivation that led Adam Werman's group to study uh, online convex optimization, where you have some small uh, forecasting of the future. And of course, this uh, method, this class of methods was very successful and is deployed in you know, a range of real world uh, high performance computing data centers and, and compute centers uh, worldwide. And so that's what, sort of the, where the initial motivation came from. My uh, interest in this area comes from applications to robotics and control. Um, so here at Caltech, uh, I do a lot of work on robotics and we're roboticists. Here's just one example where we're trying to do tracking control under predictable disturbances. So we have a well-specified dynamical system of a drone in this case, and it's trying to track a trajectory through a, let's say for now, predictable wind disturbance. So this is something that we could actually experiment with on hardware at Caltech. Other applications that I've worked on in the past include things like tracking the gameplay of, let's say, a basketball game scene while uh, minimizing smoothness, oh, sorry, while well, maximizing smoothness because you don't want your broadcast camera to be overly jerky. You want it to be smoothly transitioning because that's what gives rise to aesthetically pleasing broadcast footage. So, and, and, and to some extent, you can forecast or predict where the gameplay might evolve to in the next few time steps. So these are two examples that motivate my interest in, in thinking about um, this type of problem. There's another connection I just wanna highlight, which is a connection to an area of work called bo convex body chasing. And the basic idea of convex body chasing is you start with a state X naught, the, the world gives you a body that you need to be inside of in the next time step. And then in the next time, and then you pay a switching cost, which is the distance from X naught to X one. Then in the next time step, the world gives you a body, a convex body that you, you need to be inside of. And then you pick an X2 that minimizes, uh, well, that, you know, and you pay a switching cost and so on and so forth. So this is the convex body chasing problem. And the, and the goal is, you know, to have an algorithm to choose a sequence of Xs that uh, for any sequence of convex bodies that are chosen minimizes the total switching cost. And so the algorithm decision is, you know, where do you decide to move without knowing that all the entire future sequence of convex bodies that you may be uh, given to solve this problem. And so clearly, uh, you know, online, smooth online convex optimization can solve, an algorithm for SoCo can solve convex body chasing because you just define your, uh, you know, your, your, your hitting cost, sorry, there's a typo here, um, as this sort, of, this sort of indicator function, are you in the region of the convex body or not, or infinite otherwise, and then you pay the switching cost. It turns out that a convex body chasing algorithm can also solve a SoCo problem. So you get this two-way reduction. And the direction is a little bit more complicated, and it was uh, it was sort of established by this, I I, I think fairly seminal work by S uh, Sebastian Bubeck and his collaborators, um, where you define uh, you know sort of an epigraph style of convex function to convex body, and then you project back onto the x-axis uh, in the next time step to to model the switching cost and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, my interest is in online control. So uh, like in the previous talk, we have some sort of dynamical system. And I just wanna emphasize that if you actually work on real robotic systems, there's, you know, there, there's actually you know, the choice of time discretization is actually very important when you get things working on a real robotic system. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that in this talk, I just wanna, as an aside. Uh, and, and so and typically you know, in a computer science, more computer science style research project, we just assume there's a discretization, but you know, that choice of discretization matters a lot. Um, so here we have the discrete time dynamical system um, uh, and the, you know, the, the standard one that is most commonly studied is the linear time invariant system, LTI, where it's, you know, a, we have a, you know, the nominal un 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 unactuated dynamics matrix A, the actuated uh, dynamics matrix B, and there's some disturbance. Um, and then you have some additive control objective. So sum over all your T time steps, some cost, the quadratic cost is in red, and that gives rise to LQR, um, which was also discussed in the previous talk, which is an LTI, what the simplest form of LQR is an L linear time invariant system with additive quadratic control cost. 
And so um, we're going to, for the bulk of this talk, focus on things that look like LQR. And so the types of questions people ask, just broadly speaking, are things like, do we know A and B a priori, or must we learn it on the fly? Uh, what, uh, or otherwise, what assumptions can we make on A and B? Is the disturbance W sub T observed before or after committing to your control action U sub T? Uh, what assumptions can we make on W sub T, the disturbance? And how do we measure performance in, for instance, regret or competitive ratio? And I realized after hearing the previous talk that I should also add, can you fully observe the state X sub T or is it partially observed? That's, an, that's something I should, I should also add to this slide. Um, so, you know, the assumption that we, we're gonna make is that A and B are known and stabilizable, uh, possibly strongly stabilizable, uh, like, like discussed in the previous talk, um, that the disturbances up to some forecast horizon is predictable and bounded. Um, and we're gonna measure performance using competitive ratio. And so just to recall back to our um, tracking control. So the idea here would be like, you know, if we could forecast the entire desired trajectory that this drone should fly, and if we could forecast, you know, what the wind disturbances might be in the future, um, possibly perfectly, possibly imperfectly with some small error, what should the optimal controller be? How do we compare that against the offline optimal that could have forecast everything in the future perfectly? And similarly for the sports, uh, uh, you know, um, application, if, if we had known the, tr the optimal set of decisions to smoothly cover um, and broadcast the game uh, well, with perfect knowledge of how the gameplay will unfold into the future, how do we compare against that? So that's the basic idea. And so this is competitive control for our problems. At each time step T, we observe the state, fully observed, and we observe um, some uh, uh, estimate of the disturbances uh, possibly imperfect. So W hat sub T is possibly an imperfect estimate of W sub T, possibly a perfect estimate. Uh, this is, uh, and then, you know, this is essentially a form of fixed horizon control or a very simple version of model predictive control. And in this talk, I'll mainly focus on step size one. So you only observe a W sub T and not the future. Although we have, I'll just briefly mention some references where we extend beyond one step prediction. You choose your control action and you repeat. And the goal is to minimize competitive ratio relative to the offline optimal that it gets to see everything up front before choosing the sequence of control actions. Some comments about competitive control versus regret in uh, competitive ratio, excuse me, versus regret in the linear in the control setting. So a very common way of me to measure performance in this setting in online control is to measure regret versus the best static linear controller, which looks something like this. So you K is from your class of linear linear controllers. Um, however, it has been shown by people, uh, so the references are in the bottom, by Dylan Foster and Max Simchowitz and by Gotham Gol and uh, Babak Hasidi, uh, that, that the best static linear controller may have arbitrarily large competitive ratio versus the all-time optimal, certainly not constant competitive ratio. And so if you're competing against this weaker benchmark and your real world application demands that you, you need to have strong competitive ratio for various practical reasons, then you know, measuring regret versus the best static linear controller may not give you the kind of guarantees that translate to real world performance for certain types of applications. And so I'll, I'll walk you through uh, sort of the high level idea of uh, one of our papers uh, and then I'll conclude. And so the way that we um, sort of approach this problem is uh, the first thing we did was uh, consider a, a special case of LQR, which we call input disturbed squared regulator. That's what you see in the, in the, in the formula there, where the, uh, the cost is squared cost rather than full quadratic cost. And the disturbance is just in the input control inputs rather than uh, you know, full, a full disturbance model. We have a generalization to the general LQR setting, which we are finalizing uh, uh, soon, but this is the results that we have published. And we're gonna we're gonna take this setting, and we're gonna do our, we're gonna construct a reduction to a new online convex optimization setting called online convex optimization with structured memory. Uh, and I should just mention as an aside that you know actually many robotic systems are well described by input disturbed uh, squared regulators. So this work was recently or is going to appear uh, at NERFs uh, later this year. And so this is the setting. Uh, so the way we do this is we do this reduction. 
And so here's how the new, here's how online convex optimization with uh, structured memory works. Uh, I should mention that it is a novel uh, OCO setting. Um, and so you basically convert this input disturbed squared regulator problem into this form where you have this hitting cost and the switching cost and the structured memory arises in the switching cost uh, where you see um, that you see there and C sub I indicates the sort of the previous I time steps um, from time step, current time step T. And so the problem is, is so this is fully described by you knowing all the C sub I's up front and then you get exposed to this S of T's on the fly. And so the basic idea, and I won't go into the details, although I think you can sort of see the high level intuition just from this, from this slide, is that the Y sub T's is a transformed representation of the state X sub T. And the choice of P, how far back you look into the past, depends on the dynamics. For example, are you doing a single, examples include, are you doing single integrator, double integrator, et cetera. Um, and then you choose the next state Y sub T indirectly via the control action U sub T. So there's a transformation via, there's a linear transformation essentially because we're, we're dealing with a linear dynamical system. And that's how the reduction of works essentially at a high level. And knowing, if you know W sub T exactly, then that exactly defines uh, the, uh, the hitting cost F sub T. If you know it approximately, then you only know S sub T approximately not, and not exactly. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the reduction. And now I'm gonna, at a high level, and now I'm gonna give you the algorithm, which is called optimistic regularized online balanced descent. And I'll give it to you in three slides. Uh, first I'll present online balanced descent, then regularized online balanced descent, then our algorithm, optimistic regularized online balanced descent. So online balance descent uh, was proposed from Adam Werman's group a few years ago. And so here's how it works in a nutshell. Um, so you have your previous state Y sub T. So now I'm, I'm working in the, only in the reduction in online convex optimization. So now the control aspect is completely abstracted away for now. We know what the minimizer of the hitting cost for the next time step is. We can compute that because we observe it. And we can compute these level sets. And gradient descent says, well, I want to take a step you know, in the gradient normal for my previous point, y sub t minus one. Balanced descent says, well, okay, since I know, you know y sub, uh, f sub t up front, I can actually compute a step that hits me towards the same level set, but is closer in terms of minimizing the switching cost, right? So this orange line achieves the same F sub T in hitting cost, but it minimizes the switching cost. Sorry, and that's essentially online balance ascent in a nutshell. Uh, greedy or regularized online balance ascent it goes one step further. This is an extension from Anna Werman's group um, where after you take this online balance ascent step, you take another step directly towards the minimizer. So your Y sub T now is you take, a, you take this online balance descent step and then you take another small step directly towards the minimizer. And it turns out that you know, this cartoon, which is called greedy online balance descent can be made equivalent to solving a regularized optimization problem that, that um, you see up front, that you see in the red, excuse me. And optimistic regularized online balance set is the setting where, okay, we don't actually observe the disturbances exactly. We only observe it approximately. So it belongs to some confidence set, omega sub t. What that means is that f sub t is actually only approximately known. We don't know exactly what f sub t is. And so optimistic ROBD basically says, well, we're going to choose the w sub t within this confidence set optimistically that minimizes the total cost. So we're going to choose so that, that gets compiled through the reduction to an F sub T that minimizes the total cost. Otherwise it's just, and then we just call ROBD multiple times. That's the basic idea. And then, you know, you can get a competitive ratio that looks like this is, this is a simplified form. Uh, the, full, uh, for, the full expression is a bit more complicated. It is, the, the thing I just want to emphasize is that this is a constant competitive ratio. It does not depend on the total time horizon. 
and the and the constants here depends on various properties of the problem. Lambda is is one of the lambdas in the regularized ROBD um, algorithm. If you're interested in the details, I, I invite you to check out our paper that's appearing on NeurIMS. Okay, so um, just to summarize, uh, competitive ratio is a strong benchmark uh, that is practically relevant for many real world applications. Um, through studying competitive control, uh, you know, we've designed algorithms for competitive control uh, through a reduction to a new OCO, OCO setting called online convex optimization with structured memory. We've also been working uh, on you know, long-term forecasting, so, to, so knowing more than just the, the disturbance in the next time step or the immediate time step, but future time steps as well, and also with delay, whether if we have delay in our ability to measure the state. And so we have a sequence of uh, a series of two papers on this. And we've also been working on designing online algorithms for, online, for competitive control in nonlinear dynamical systems. So the bulk of work in online control has been for linear dynamical systems. And we've been really focused uh, re very recently on designing algorithms for nonlinear dynamical systems. And so it, re it requires you know, delving a bit more into control theory. And so our approach is an Oracle-based approach. We hope to have a preprint pre uh, coming out soon on archive where the oracles are specified from, from control theory. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, especially in the, the work talked about today, Yi Hong and Guanya, who did the bulk of that work, and the references are below. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. That was a, another really great talk. Um, well, actually, we're now back on time. Thank you. <laughs> and does anyone have any questions? I believe yeah. uh, Mary had one question in the our chat. Lambda, yeah. What are Lambda? Um, yes, so, okay. Good question. So you have to, so, so um, lambda two, so lambda one, uh, let me see if I remember <laughs> my, the, the details right. So you have to choose, uh, so this lambda here, which is something you choose, and then you could choose in a way that minimizes this max of these two terms, um, you, is, is lambda one. Uh, and then lambda two is, I think, typically set uh, according to um, some properties of the dynamical system that are fairly basic. And actually, I had a question. How are you uh, quantifying the uncertainty in the error estimates for the Ws? Yeah, so great. So, you know, in the previous talk, uh, uh, you know, it was assumed that uh, Ws are bounded in terms of, in terms of like adversarial across all possible W sequences. So, uh, you know, similar types of assumptions need to be made here. So, you know, of course, W is bounded, then the uncertainty in W is also bounded. So omega T is a bounded set with a known radius, if you will. And, and they can be uh, adversarial. Yeah, the then, and then, you know, WC it can be chosen adversarially within that omega T at each time step. So this particular bound here that I'm showing is when omega sub T is a singleton set. So you know WT exactly. So when omega sub T is not a singleton set, there's an epsilon, that's the radius of this omega T that also comes into the to the picture. Do you have any idea of how uh, good this constant is? Are there any little doubts for this problem or? Um, that's probably a question best asked for Adam Weirman. <laughs> um, I, I, I certainly there are lower bounds. Um, look, I mean, a trivial lower bound is one, obviously. Um, uh, I think for general, I think for general online convex optimization, the lower bound is like one plus one over, sorry, excuse me. For, for general uh, online convex optimization, the lower bound is um, root square root of D where D is the dimensionality of the, of, the, of, the, of the state space Y. And then for convex, for, for strongly convex optimizations, which LQR, which certain, which many flavors of LQR satisfy, it's one plus, one over square root of M, where M is the strongly convex parameter. And those are in previous work um, from Adam Werman's group. I think some of it's from Sebastian Brubeck and his collaborators. Uh, 
Hey, Yisong. So hey. Thanks, thanks for this very nice talk. Uh, I think this is very, very cool. I'm just, I'm just wondering if you think that all this uh, algorithmic machinery that you're using in this paper is actually all that necessary. So, okay, I'm asking this because in these control problems, there are natural movement costs in the first place already, right? So if you're, you know, changing around your policy a lot, then you're going to be like, you know, dragging your system up and down and all sorts of crazy things are going to happen. So you always need to make sure that you're switching slowly or you're switching rarely between your policies. So do you think that these properties in existing solutions are not enough? Like the ones that, uh, for example, Naman was explaining in the previous talk, do you think that you know, it would be possible to get competitive ratio guarantees for those algorithms? Or that you think that these are really essential? These So I, I can't speak for everything thing that Naman described. Um, uh, but I will say that for just linear controllers, which was maybe the basic version of what Naman described, where you're comparing the regret against the best linear controller in hindsight, it is known from those two papers referenced below that they have they can have arbitrarily bad competitive constant uh, arbitrarily bad competitive ratio. Yeah, right. But eventually the algorithm that they use uses this kind of online learning with memory uh, right, sort of right, setup. Right. And that actually competes with a richer class, which may be sufficient. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. The, I haven't thought enough. So, so let me, ask, so let me ask, answer your question in two ways. Um, you know, the one thing that I became very curious in, in, in some of my research, more generally speaking, is you know gradient descent is a little bit like follow the leader, and Allen's balanced descent is a little bit like be the leader. Um, just to draw, I mean, the analogy is not perfect. I don't want I don't want it to like ma make that yeah. analogy tight, but it's, it's roughly speaking, right? And so we know that be the leader in in, in cases where be leader applies is stronger than follow the leader, and so it does require a little bit of forecasting, knowing where you want to go, knowing where the services come from, and and so I would just say that fundamentally, that's sort of the thing that's going on. And everything else, you know, now maybe making my own paper sound kind of incremental, but everything else that's going on is sort of layering on sort of more sophistication on top of that fundamental idea. Right, 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 gotcha. Yeah, but maybe now I'm gonna say something huh? because he's here too. Yeah, I mean, actually I had a question too. Um, it's, uh, so the statement about, because, I mean, the statement about the linear controllers uh, leading to sort of arbitrarily large uh, uh, competitive ratios, is this true when sort of your QT, Q is large? So like, is that arbitrary number coming because your Q is growing arbitrarily large? Great question. So um, obviously, um, if Q, it does depend on Q and R having certain I don't want to say pathological because they do arise in practice, um, but sure. you know you can you can certainly you can certainly as make assumptions on Q and R where where it it's not it's not arbitrarily large. Right. So that that that's what I, my understanding is that I think like I think if your Q is bounded, then in some sense you always have it might be a large competitive ratio, but you at least have a bounded competitive ratio because in some sense like you can think like the way I think about it is that like somehow the optimal policy must sort of suffer something like summation WT square, like that's kind of just unavoidable. And then linear policies like cannot, like if they, if they stabilize correctly, they should not like, and your Q is sort of bounded, you should not ever suffer more than a con like that big constant times. So in some sense, you should not suffer more than a big constant of uh, competitive yes. ratio. Like, yeah, I, good point. So I, I, maybe I should have been a little bit more careful here. Arbitrary large is with respect to a certain parameter. Um, and, and that parameter may or not be relevant for your application. Right, right, right. That was yeah. That was just my so like just to relate it back to Gogli's point, like like somehow like the sort of the amount of movement that sort of our algorithm makes will also kind of depend upon how large this queue is kind of assumed to be, right? Like it kind of represents uh, like sort of uh, how large these uh, sort of functions are. So maybe yeah. that kind of answers your question. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've, we've been running, we've been starting to run experiments, of course. Um, and, you know, we, we do observe that like this algorithm, um, 
there are applications where this algorithm significantly outperforms the best static linear control. Um, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Hey, sure. Ah, uh, how you saying? Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so the clarifying question is about like, maybe the big difference is that whether the disturbances are predictable or not, right? That's right. That's right. Like a lot of times we are not going to assume like in the regret formulation that you have any sort of information. Mm -hmm. the disturbance is completely unpredictable. It's That's noise. Right. There's That's no right. structure. That's right. And, uh, but of course, uh, if it's predictable, you should take into account the, the disturbances, how you can predict them. And, and my understanding was that this is what this framework is trying to capture. Correct. More, more or less, yes, correct. Yeah. So Which is example, relevant yeah. if you take this linearization viewpoint, I guess, to nonlinear systems that these linear systems are kind of like approximate. Uh, or if you want to do a solve a then... Or if you want to solve a tracking problem, uh, then the, the, the desired tracking is, there's a way to formulate the LQ tracking problem right. that where the, it's built into the W, right? Um, right, you know, it had a trajectory and so you kind of, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I'm, I'm you know, I just to clarify, just to, just to clarify, you know, I'm really motivated by solving these types of practical problems. I mean, like the, the drone example is kind of crazy in it because if you think about the wind as a disturbance, like nothing is predictable there. <laughs> So it depends. The trajectory, okay. yeah. Like you, you can you can say that the trajectory and the dynamics of the plane, like in a steady flow, but like not in uh, in this. Uh, so yeah. So you know, this is certainly this is a conversation I've I've had with roboticists um, for several years now. And the way okay. that roboticists here think about the problem is, of course, the general problem is impossible. There are classes of wind conditions or classes of aerodynamics where you can say something a little bit more bounded about what you might expect to happen. Um, and that's how they make progress in designing more sophisticated controllers. So, so, so certainly I agree that in the general case that, you know, but I think the aerodynamics and control and robotics community are a bit, have, you know, been thinking about how to sort of create this taxonomy of problems, some of which are more tractable than others. And you, then you could think about how to impose things like competitive control on those classes of problems. So that's the approach that you're trying to Oh. Yeah, suppose there is a gust of wind, but you know you assume that the wind, you know, roughly is static and, and doesn't change too much over from time to time. Clearly, it doesn't work in a hurricane, but I think, but you know, uh, broadly speaking, there are many instances where if the, there's a gust of wind, the wind mm -hmm. stays static for a long time period. You should remember that these mm -hmm. controllers are operating in, in certain cases at 500 hertz, right? Yeah. So, so, so you know, at 500 hertz, that means each capital, each time step T is is 0 0.0002 seconds. I hope they did the math right. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so there's a certain Monitor. amount of predictability of whatever the wind is at one time step, you, it doesn't change much at the next time step. Mm -hmm. I see. So that somehow relates to this optimism in online learning as well, but okay, I guess it's a longer conversation, I guess. Like the optimistic algorithms in online learning are also trying to to somehow capture that, in which case, you know, like you change the algorithm, you change the way you are thinking about the regret, and like it seems maybe there is some uh, smooth interpolation possible between these two settings. Uh, yeah. So one instance we, that we looked at, just just to uh, sorry, I, I I realize we should have an open discussion now, but just one concrete instance is omega sub t, the uncertainty about the disturbance from the wind is mm -hmm. whatever the previous wind measurement was plus some little error based on the, your lip yeah. of how well fast the wind changes from 0 0.002 seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the, so just, just, as, just as a concrete example. Right, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Okay. Um, maybe before we uh, open up into a channel of discussion, I was wondering if anyone had any questions specifically for the on stuff because we didn't get a chance to before. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had a, a query on, on regarding uh, uh, the uh, uh, hitting cost and uh, uh, switching cost, and uh, there is a change in potential that is uh, del of uh, phi t. So how does that impact our theorem? 
I'm not. I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, let me uh, try to uh, rephrase it. So it's the change in uh, potential. Uh, if I uh, look at the paper. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was a bit uh, confused with respect to the Foster constant and the change in potential. Yeah. So. Change in potential. Um, it, oh, okay, I see. Um, this might be a discussion that's better taken offline and including uh, uh, my students. Um, I, I, I might struggle to go through every line in this proof with the level of sophistication that they might, they can do. Good. Um, any question for Amanda? I have one. So, uh, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I had a question. Yes, yeah, so I had a question yeah. to Naman. So does so does your setting actually allow the coasts and the disturbances to depend on the interaction history as well, like the past states and the past controls, or that is not necessarily allowed in uh, in this? Um, so, I mean, I guess there are two answers to it. In some sense, um, it depends on what you allow in your comparator in some sense. Like, like you could really have this game where like you're playing with an adversary who's choosing based on what you're playing. And that's legit. As long as in your comparator, it's the same choices. And depending on whether you find that admissible or not, like the answer is a yes or no. Like, you know, it, like for instance, disturbances, right? Like it's unclear if they're being chosen sort of on like, while you're playing the game, why should you compare yourself to the same disturbances in the comparator, right? So, um, so in that sense, it is, um, yeah, the answer is kind of like a partial yes or a partial no, however you want to look at it. Right, so I guess the results continue to hold as stated, right? But yeah, the result they are meaningful or no. Yeah, yeah the, the result continues to hold as stated, basically. Right? Well, you you can choose them as you're playing the game, but your comparator then has to be on the same choices that were made before. Right. So you don't account for the counterfactuals on this front. Only yeah, in, like, front in that sense, the adaptive are... adversary in the com in the counterfactual notion of regret cannot adapt to your sort of choices there. Like at least we don't know how to sort of handle that case. I believe that case is kind of extremely hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I have a. Sorry. Are you are you done? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. I have a question for Naman. So I'm really curious yeah. about your, the, the, the thing you mentioned very briefly at the end of your talk about this application to like medical um, uh, monitoring or, or, or I wasn't, it was flash. Oh yeah, um, sure. Um, so um, I, so this is something that uh, sort of um, we've been working on in the lab and then like in this case sort of like the objective in some sense is completely sort of clear. You kind of have like a real ventilator and sort of you want to design controls to um, uh, um, just have the full sort of patient follow a certain breath pattern. That's what you're doing in sort of ventilator control, right? I wasn't quite mentioning sort of the ventilator thing necessarily as, a, as an example uh, or as, as a potential application for the theory that I was actually describing. Uh, that was so sort of what we're doing at this point of time is sort of holistically uh, kind of uh, approaching the problem, but sort of one approach that sort of we have for the problem is to sort of learn a simulator for the ventilator. And that naturally sets up sort of some notion of disturbance, between, uh, some notion of perturbation between sort of your simulator and your real world. And there you can sort of hope to apply these kinds of algorithms. Okay. And then maybe one question I had there is that um, I'm not familiar with your, work, your, your group's work on partial observability. So I should really catch up on that. But it seems to me like that you have to be a little bit more I don't know, maybe your thoughts on partial observability in those types of settings? Right, so, okay, this is um, this is not particularly my work. I wasn't involved, but like, I, I'm happy to comment on it. Um, basically, um, in the case of partial observability, as far as I understand, um, essentially what, like, what you can, so similar to something like what we had, like, which is this disturbance action policy, like, what's sufficient is, I think they come up with this notion of, uh, uh, they call it nature's wise. Uh, basically, like if indeed sort of um, I sort of executed the system uh, with sort of um, like just look at sort of various like just make a basis out of sort of 
looking at the execution of the system under various noise and sort of look at the observation sequences that you would have observed. Um, the only the, this connects to this connects deeply to sort of this notion that I, I personally am not super familiar with the the EULA parameterization. Um, and you get basically at the, like the end of the story is that like making assumptions ex very similar to the, the assumptions that we're making, you get very similar results. Basically, you can get uh, sort of square root T regret rates uh, if you have like a known system uh, under adversarial noise and things like that. Um, and you could get slightly better rates if you got, I, I guess something that I didn't get to in my talk, you could get like uh, potentially better rates if you have like strongly convex costs and things like that. But at the end of the day, you sort of basically you 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 can get the same result um, that we established in the partially observable case. Yeah, let me because you asked this question, let me just point to sort of I guess um, the work that does it. I guess I can just link to it in some sense while other people ask questions. Um, yeah, um, it's uh, it's the work by uh, Maxim Kovitz, Karan, uh, Karan Singh, and Lal Hazan. Uh, 